Hello, today is March 26, 2012. We're meeting today with Mr. Warren Garst at his home in Fort Collins, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Warren, and thanks for sitting down today to, to tell your story. Thank you. Let's start out, if we could. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. Okay. <clears throat> I was born on September 21, 1922, in Douglas, Wyoming. <clears throat> My father was a lawyer. Uh, he had actually been here in Fort Collins uh, prior to going to Douglas. Uh, <clears throat> and my mother, Doris Garst, was a writer. She wrote under the name of Shannon Garst and published 44 books for children and uh, was quite an influence in my life. Of course, so was my father. <clears throat> my father was an avid at outdoorsman. His father was well known in Denver he was the uh, represent Western representative for Marshall Fields, a Chicago mer mercantile store. But I think my grandfather was best known as a an outdoorsman, and the mayors of Denver would ask him to take uh, honored visitors out hunting and fishing. And, and my grandfather finally wrote a book about uh, hunting and fishing for the tenderfoot in Colorado. So my father was, of course, well indoctrinated in this. He had been a, uh, at one time, uh, he was a hunter, professional hunter, you might say, for a ranch. I think this is probably during his high school years that he would go out in the summer and work on this ranch. And his job was to go out and kill deer and sage chickens, catch fish and things like that to feed the farmhands. These were the days before they had really strict game laws. And uh, uh, so he was well indoctrinated into hunting and fishing. And I, uh, we used to invite the coaches from University of Colorado up to uh, uh, Douglas then go fishing with him. And I remember one basketball coach that I came on him. He was sitting beside the stream just watching my dad fish. And I said, well, why aren't you fishing? He said, I just like to watch an artist at work. <laughs> so uh, uh, this was pretty much one of my influences in life. My mother recognized the fact that I liked animals. We lived, <clears throat> lived in Douglas, but our house was within a block of the edge of town. We used to hike up on a hill just a block or so from the house, and I'd bring home uh, the little horned toads. Uh, we had a, a snake there that I'd bring home, uh, no longer there, a uh, little uh, hognose snake. and the. Uh, we, we would bring home these little animals, and uh, she would encourage us to do that. Uh, my sister would bring home any cat that she could find, too. We used to have many cats around the house, and of course we had a dog at one time. Uh, but I was mostly interested in the wild animals. Yeah. Now you mentioned a sister. Uh, any other brothers or sisters? Yes, we, I had one, one older brother, uh, Joe. And I had a younger sister, Barbara, uh, and we grew up in this this house. We were fairly close. We were 18 months apart, each of us, and uh, uh, it was uh, in those days. It wasn't like the present. We had sort of free run. Our mothers didn't take us to to a lot of. Uh, uh, activities. They used to uh, encourage us to go to piano lessons and things like that. But they wouldn't take us. We walked. And uh, I, I didn't last long at piano lessons. <laughs> I, I wish now that I had, but I didn't. And I don't understand that because we had a uh, grand piano in our living room and my dad had a ukulele. 
and he had been the leader of the uh, uh, Glee Club at the University of Colorado when he was a student there. So apparently he was a good singer, but music was never a part of my life. In fact, uh, I am a non-singer because when I was in the eighth grade, my teacher asked me to please don't sing with a class because I threw the rest of them off. <laughs> and later when I was in the fraternity, we spent a month rehearsing for a song that we were going to sing in competition with other fraternities. And the night of the competition, they asked me to please step out and let some fellow from Denver who had never practiced and let him step in in my place. <laughs> so I, I am what I call a non-singer. Yeah. I couldn't been discouraged in that. Now, did, did you grow up then uh, through your entire youth in, in Douglas? Uh, I spent all my youth in Douglas. My, uh, as I said, my mother was a writer. Mm -hmm. She didn't get into that until uh, uh, all of late in my high school years. And, and, uh, in those years, uh, the basketball, we didn't have pro basketball as they do now. They had what we call semi-pro teams and uh, my father was very interested in those and he, one year he took us to Denver, my brother and I, to uh, see this, the national championship games there. When we came back, we found out that we were quarantined out of the house. My sister had gotten scarlet fever, some oh sort of contagious disease, and they were quarantined in the house for a month. I lived with a, with a friend down a block from home. My brother went to another home and uh, lived there for a while. My dad lived in the hotel, and uh, it, my mother just took that opportunity when the house was quiet and she wrote a book. Mm -hmm. And that was the start of her career as a, as a published author. So wow. uh, she, as I said, she had eventually written 44 books that were published under, her, under the name of Shannon Garst. She chose the name of, uh, of Wesley Shannon, her stepfather. Uh, her name was really Doris Garst, but she learned early on from her publishers that a female writer in those days had low chance of publication or selling, so she chose a name that is sort of, uh, could be either male or female, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and chose Shannon Garst for that. Well, one question I always like to ask your generation, uh, do you have much memory and or was your family affected much by the Great Depression? Yes, we were. Uh, <clears throat> we, we were, uh, I was a kid then, and I didn't, didn't uh, really recognize what was going on. I, I just know that our, our allowances, which in those days were about 10 cents a week, uh, Sometimes my folks had a little trouble paying that, but they, they managed usually. My father being a lawyer, uh, he had to do a lot of work uh, sort of on a barter system. But a lot of times he would do law work and bring home payment in chickens or, or eggs or maybe a side of beef or something like that. It, uh, the the people could trade for things, but uh, we did know that they were they were always talking about how hard money was to come by, and uh, but being kids, we didn't didn't matter to us. We we didn't know we were poor. Yeah, uh, it was just life, and everyone else was in the same boat. Yeah. So we, we were pretty happy with the, with the situation. And we lived in what I thought was a, a big house. In those days, it uh, was the biggest on the block. And uh, you look at it now, and it, it's, in fact, there, there's a, uh, 
a brochure out showing the historic houses in Douglas, and they, they listed it as a cottage. <laughs> so uh, my uh, perceptions were have changed. Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, uh, I've gone back to the house and I've always thought that the house has really shrunk because the rooms are a lot smaller than I remember. And uh, I remember we used to, there used to be four steps going up the front porch and I, in my youth, I used to take those all in one jump and uh, get up on the porches in one leap. <laughs> and, uh, think things, as I said, it was like the snowdrifts. I used to shovel the walks in the winter, and it was a corner house, so I had a lot of walks to shovel. They, they went around the front for about, oh, I'd say uh, 100 feet around the front, and about 150 feet around the side. So it was a lot of sidewalk. And we used to have a drift in front of the house, and that would be up to my uh, my shoulders. And I thought, well, well boy, it was pretty deep snow. Well, I, I always remember snow days, snow drifts up to my shoulder. Well, nowadays they don't get that high, but I forget how how short I was in those days. <laughs> yeah. so, so perceptions change. Yeah. But uh, life was uh, pretty simple in those days, and we, uh, uh, my father was a very athletic person. He had played baseball in, uh, in college. Uh, I remember when I went down to college, University of Colorado, and I was trying to establish in, an account. There was a uh, a druggist on the campus who uh, uh, would give you a sort of a savings account. I went in and, and uh, talked to him about establishing account. He said, well, are you the son of Joe Garst? And I said, yes. And he said, he was the best uh, shortstop I'd ever seen play. Mm -hmm. So, and he used to uh, uh, play baseball for the mining camps. I know he, he used to work at the Jerome Hotel in, in Aspen. He was a night clerk there in the daytime. He would play, play baseball. And I said, well, didn't they pay you for playing baseball to make you a pro? And he said, oh, no. No, he said, I, I just had a job as a uh, clerk. And how we made money playing baseball is we'd come up to bat and some fell up and they in the stands would yell out, $10 for a home run. And he said, we'd hit the home run, run circle of bases, you know, right into the stands and collect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, so you mentioned University of Colorado. So after you graduated, from, what year did you graduate from high school? I graduated in 1940. 40? But I uh, started school at Caltech. Uh, oh, okay. My, uh, my brother uh, started at uh, CU. He went to... See you and started there. He wanted to be a chemical engineer, and he started there. And he was in a sophomore year. He decided he would rather go to Caltech. Uh, and my dad said, "Well, why don't you go there too?" He said, "I'm, I'm going to retire." And uh, he had uh, bought a uh, an interest in a golf driving range in Alhambra, California, which is right next door to Pasadena. Uh, and he's, he said it would be nice to have you two boys together. So, so I took the application or the test to get into Caltech. And, and uh, part of it was a uh, personal interview with a professor from Caltech who came out to interview me. And, and he came into the uh, school at just the optimum time for me because it was just before graduation there was a big cup standing in the principal's office with my name on it that I was going to receive as being the, oh, I forget, something like the outstanding uh, 
athletes. I was the football captain of the football team, and, and uh, uh, I was twice state champion in, in track and the half mile. Wow! And uh, uh, these things were a big influence on me getting into Caltech because they, when we finally got out to to Pasadena, the fellow said I really was was borderline in my tests. And he didn't think anyone from a small high school like I had gone to could really make it out there. And uh, uh, he was pretty close to right because I found it very difficult. And uh, my brother and I roomed together there for a year and a half. But while I was at Caltech in my sophomore year, in the middle of my sophomore year, the, the war broke out. And uh, I was unhappy at Caltech because I was just having a real struggle. And uh, I decided I would like to transfer to the University of Colorado. And we made that arrangement very quickly. My father saw to it. But I got into the University of Colorado and I went down there. And, and uh, but we were at Caltech when the war broke out. And I can remember very clearly the, uh, my brother and I had gone down this uh, Sunday morning, and I don't know how we got down to the golf driving range, uh, but we were sitting there in the uh, the caddy shack with the with the uh, manager of the place, and listening to the radio, and they were talking about a raid on Pearl Harbor. And I said, Where the hell's Pearl Harbor? I didn't know where the yeah. Pearl Harbor was in those days. But it sounded pretty serious. And I, uh, anyway, the, the tone of the broadcast was very impressive, and I remember that very clearly. And the next day <coughs> in school, the, the uh, professor, the same one who had interviewed me in, uh, in Douglas, he, he was the teacher of a class I was having on, uh, uh, I think it was English or something to do any, anywhere. I know I had to write essays for him. But he came into class and all we did was listen to President Roosevelt declare war on the radio. So, uh, but anyway, right after that we had, uh, had the midterm break. My brother and I drove back to uh, Douglas. I guess we drove back. I, I can't remember how we got back. Mm -hmm. We didn't have a car in those days, but somehow or other we got home. And uh, uh, I did, did my transfer, and my brother went back to Caltech. And, uh, we went, uh, I went, we entered school there and we were doing doing okay, but uh, things were pretty upset in those days because we young fellas were just itching to do something. And uh, uh, there were so many things going on, we didn't know which way to turn. Uh, all of us were eligible for the draft. We all had draft numbers, I remember, but uh, I think we were advised to wait because the both Army and Navy were setting up programs, and we waited, and I think it was the spring of uh, 1942 that I enlisted. I, I uh, uh, like most of the others my age, I, we volunteered. And, uh, I think I was called to duty. I, I've written down the dates somewhere. But we weren't uh, called into active duty for some time. Uh, but I remember when uh, when we first were, and I got my first uniform. And uh, uh, I was wearing it proudly. And I, I met my girlfriend, and, and she broke out laughing. The uniform was so well fitting that 
that it looked really horrible on me. But she really hurt my feelings then because I was I was trying to feel real proud about being in the in the service. Now, which branch did you enlist? I, I enlisted in the Navy. They had uh, programs there in V7 and V12. My brother, who was a Caltech, later transferred back to Colorado also, and he joined, uh, I forget which was which, I think I was in V12, which was uh, just for the, uh, just plain Navy. V7, I think, was for the Air Force. Naval Air Force, and my brother uh, signed up for that. Now, here's uh, two boys from landlocked uh, Wyoming. How did you come to choose the Navy? This is a strange thing, but uh, Wyoming boys seem to prefer the Navy for some reason. I don't know why, but uh, uh, they do. It, and, uh, it's strange because during World War One, the, the Wyoming Cowboys were well noted for for being so rugged and, and uh, being able to take the the uh, hardships of, of soldiers' life. But uh, somehow or other, the Navy appeared appealed to me. And this is also strange. My dad was uh, involved in the politics of the state. He was uh, very good friends with the senators and good, uh, uh, congressmen. And before I got into college, he asked if I would be interested in a uh, uh, position at either West Point or Annapolis. <coughs> Pardon me. And uh, I thought, don't worry about it. No, I didn't. I really didn't want to. This was before there was any any war right. or even any talk about it. Uh, but he could have gotten me an appointment to, to one or the other. Uh, I went through the uh, naval program at uh, CU, uh, which was eventually they got us all together and they, they Put us in. Uh, we they moved us uh, my my group into a, uh, what had been a women's dorm, and uh, uh, that was our barracks. And uh, we used to train, get up early in the morning and train. Uh, the group I trained with was really with the Marines, so we would get out uh, before dawn and and do calisthenics on the, on the grassy areas of the, of the campus, and uh, then do marches around the town. And, uh, we weren't very popular then because we'd march up and down the streets. We, we'd be uh, calling out, you know, hook one, two, three, you know, this business. But uh, uh, Mainly, it was still going through school and getting our education. But finally, they called us to active duty, and I was sent to Annapolis for uh, midshipman school. Uh, my brother-in-law, who was at the University of Wyoming, at that time he wasn't my brother-in-law. He was just he had been the valedictorian in my class at, at high school, and uh, he and I got on the train together in Douglas, and we. Uh, she, you know, got on. We met my uh, uh, lady in Omaha. Uh, she had married my brother. She, we, they established a prisoner of war camp in Douglas, and she was working there. And somehow or other, he met her and married her. And uh, uh, anyway. He was in, in, uh, in uh, Chicago for, with the naval people training, but then they, uh, his wife had a baby, and uh, that was against the rules in those days that we could be married and uh, uh, be in these programs. 
so he was kicked out of that, and he was at the uh, uh, Great Lakes Naval Station there. But we all met him at the station in, in Chicago, and uh, then Chuck, my brother-in-law, who my at that time not brother-in-law, my friend, he he went on to New York. And he was uh, he got his midship training at Columbia University. I went to Annapolis. Uh, first, I went to Asbury Park, New Jersey, where they put us in an, an old it had been a resort hotel that had been taken over by the British Navy. And uh, we got in there, and the place was a mess. And we spent the first week just cleaning it up and. and uh, getting it so we could live in it. And my memories of that place was that it was cold and blustery and dank, and I didn't like New Jersey very well, except that I had a window that looked out over the ocean, and I could now and then see a dolphin or something like that, mm. see ships go by. And on the back side, there was a, a window that overlooked a pond, and I could s sit there and watch ospreys. Uh, fish out of the pond, and uh, it was pretty dark and dank and, and uh, miserable there. But then, come spring, they shipped me down to Annapolis, and uh, I found it very hot, and humid, and sweaty down there. But uh, they gave us good training, a lot of good marching, and. Uh, training, but uh, one of the things I remember was uh, I was in the uh, oh the residence hall there. as I was going down in this hallway. A man jumped out of the box and gave me a salute, and I, I forget what he recited, but this happened to be a friend of mine from Douglas. <laughs> My dad had arranged for his, for him and uh, another fellow from Douglas to come to Annapolis. And he was a, I guess the, I forget whether they called the freshman there, the plebes, I uh -huh. think they did. But anyway, this guy was, he was unfortunate and he was born with a grin on his face. <laughs> and that was a challenge to all the upper class when they were going to wipe that grin off his face. So they were hazing him, and, and this was one of the hazing things that he, he had to get up and uh, uh, salute anyone who came by. <laughs> but a few years later, after I'd graduated from Annapolis and I'd been out to see it while, I, I forget what city I was in, I think it was San Francisco. And wandered around the streets and I happened to go in a theater to watch the, uh, to see a movie and they had a newsreel there and it showed the graduation of ceremonies at Annapolis and this fellow was the, was the commander of the leading platoon or I, I don't know what, what the division it was but anyway he was the leader of the, uh, of the wedding uh, group there. And because of that, he was allowed to choose the girl to come out and, and uh, uh, be honored with him. And he'd chosen a sister from Douglas, so I got to see two old friends on him. I'll be done. Uh -huh. He later uh, got in, he was in the Naval Air Corps at that time, and, or after graduation, but he, he served the war in, in the Navy Air Corps. Uh, from Annapolis, I went, uh, I was sent to Norfolk, Virginia, and uh, I caught a ship down there, the USS McClanahan. I wasn't a, um, 
the permanent crew member there. I don't know what the status was, but it was sort of a, uh, an intern or apprentice anyway. This was my first adventure at sea, and we. And how was that? Once again, here's this boy, this cowboy from Douglas, Wyoming. How was it going to sea? Did you get your sea legs, or how was? Uh... I had no trouble at all. In fact, I enjoyed it. Uh, uh, we got out. We didn't do much at uh, Norfolk. I, things I remember about the McClanahanis uh, is we went up to Casco Bay, Maine, to. Uh, <coughs> pardon me. I think it was mostly for gunnery practice. We we went up there and we we were firing the five inch guns and other other guns and, and uh, we did a lot of that for training. Uh, and I can remember being the uh, officer of the deck one time and, and we were anchored out into the bay and. Uh, uh, I was just standing around on the deck, doing nothing like the officer that usually does. But there was a seal bobbing up out of the water. I was, I was having great conversations with him. <laughs> and, uh, I also had the opportunity to uh, 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 just learn a little bit more about Maine, but we didn't. I don't think I ever got ashore from when we were up there. But uh, eventually, our ship was assigned to escort a, uh, a battleship from Casco Bay, Maine, down to New York City. And uh, uh, we set out on this escort job, and the, the uh, orders were to go at 25 knots, which is a, uh, really a good speed for any ship. And the weather was horrible. It was uh, uh, very rough. And I wasn't on duty. So I wandered around trying to find a place where I could be comfortable. And I, I sat in my, uh, uh, my room. I'd sit on the bunk with my feet against the, the bulkhead trying to brace myself. And that didn't work very well. It got tiring. I went into the wardroom to uh, 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 see if I could be comfortable there. This was a room that spanned the entire width of the ship, and it had a dining table in the in the center. And on on one side there was a sort of a couch-like place where I sat down, and on on the far wall. There were the coffee pot and what we'd call the joe pot and all that sort of business. But anyway, I, I was sitting there on the, the couch with my legs braced onto the table to keep from uh, falling over. And then all of a sudden we took one, one terrible roll and, and uh, I was just picked up and lifted onto the table I slid face first the whole width of the ship into the bulkhead on the other side. And when I, and my ship just seemed to stop there. It was heeled over very far on, on the, uh, I think we were listening to the starboard at that time. And it just stayed there for a long while. Uh, Later, when I got time, I went down into the uh, engine room and I asked the chief there, I said, did you see what, uh, what our thing was on the inclinometer? And he said, well, it went clear off the inclinometer and that was, uh, that was more than 60 degrees. And uh, uh, I think we were just on the verge of capsizing when, when it just righted itself. We were, very close to that. But that uh, wave that hit us uh, took a reel of steel cable off the main deck and uh, 
took it underwater and it hit the propeller shaft and bent the propeller shaft. Uh, it had also gone up onto the uh, deck house above and taken the handles off some of the uh, some of the guns up on the uh, on the deck house. Some of the uh, 50 caliber machine guns we had up there. And uh, uh, when we got to New York, we we were. Uh, they looked at the ship and they said, no, we had to go back to Boston and go into dry dock there, get repairs, and we did that while we were in, in Boston for a week. Uh, I took a trip up to, to Casco Bay, uh, actually to, uh, to Maine. My brother was in school up there studying uh, radar. They moved him from Chicago out to Maine to uh, Bowdoin College, I believe it was, where, they, where he was being trained in radar. And uh, uh, that was my first introduction to, the, to New England when it was fall and gorgeous back there then. But uh, he came back to the ship and we made a uh, convoy across the Atlantic. It was a, uh, I think it was a nine, boy, a nine knot convoy. And I don't know how many ships we had, 50, 50 or so freighters. But I never saw them because we were in the picket ship, which was, we were 10 miles out in front of the whole, whole group, over the horizon from them. Hmm. And we were sort of leading them away, but we were doing the zigzag patterns. Uh, these convoys did, and our job was to sort of pick up the submarines as, as uh, we went along. Uh, I would go up to the chart house every now and then. Uh, I think it was the Queen Mary took out from New York at the time that we, uh, soon after we left, we watched her cross the, across the Atlantic unescorted. She did it in four days. We were taking ten. Wow! Uh, to, to go across. Now, roughly, what timeline were you? Was this when you crossed? Uh... Well, this was sort of near the the end of the war. The uh, uh, we got into. Uh, I'll get into this in a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, we went into the Mediterranean and. Uh, another thing I remember about the McLanahan, it was McLanahan. I, when I was there, they were telling me the ship was noted for for two things. It was supposed to be the fastest uh, destroyer in the Navy at that time. It was supposed to be one of the best you know, shore bomber. Anyhow, when we got into the Mediterranean and the, the convoy broke up. Our captain asked for permission to do a speed test to test our propeller shaft. And uh, we got uh, got the ship up to 36 knots as I was out on the fantail watching this. And the, uh, what we call the rooster's tail, the, uh, the wave coming up behind the ship. It was way above my head. It was very impressive to see this. And the ship was really ripping along and we were picking up speed and all of a sudden the, uh, the uh, man on the, uh, who was testing the sonar said he got a ping on something and the captain gave us an order to uh, turn to the starboard. And this was the first time I realized that these ships, instead of leaning into the curve, they leaned the other way. And we were making a, a very fast right turn, but the ship was tilting off to the left. And it was, that was also very impressive. So, uh, but we got, uh, got into uh, 
anyway, we, we found that there, we didn't find a submarine there. Uh, that speed test, another thing that I remember on the McClanahan was uh, like gunnery practices. Uh, uh, sometimes I would spend my, uh, my, my battle station was, of course, in the engine room. I was an engineering officer. But uh, every now and then I'd be an observer in, in, the, in one of the five-inch turrets when we'd be firing the five-inch guns. And um, uh, other times I'd, when we were just practicing, I wouldn't have to be at the battle station. But I remember one time we were out at sea and we were about ready to, to go into a, a practice. And I was walking along the deck and uh, there a, was a partition on the deck with a door in it. And I opened this door ready to go on the forecastle of the ship. Just at the time they let go with all four or five oh. inch guns in, in the front. And, and boy, the, the uh, blast from those things about knocked me over. Uh, really impressive. Hmm. Also, just being on the deck when they were firing all of the machine guns and everything else, the the brightness of it would uh, would almost dazzle you with with the light. It was uh, you just can't imagine the firepower of one of those little ships. Hmm. Anyway, we uh, we went to uh, Oran. And we put uh, uh, went into a uh, harbor near El Kabir, and we docked there. Uh, and it was a small place. Uh, we didn't really have a lot to do. There was a sort of a fortress up on the hill just above our uh, our dock, and I, I walked up there one day. And and looked around and I could see where this place had been under fire and there were shell fragments around the, the place. And I walked down the back side and came into a, uh, a city. Uh, and uh, I guess it was Oran that I, I went into. Anyway, I went into a place and it was sort of a mysterious looking place. It looked like a movie set. And there were, I remember uh, girls there that would sort of skitter along the, the streets, and sort of like they want, didn't want to be seen. And uh, uh, it was cobblestone streets. And it was, felt very much like a movie set. Hmm. And when I wandered out, I, uh, found out that I'd been in a restricted place. I was where American sailors were not supposed to be. Oh, jeez. But anyway, I, I went back out and uh, went back to the ship. And while we were at the ship, we used to play a little uh, scrimmage football on the, on the dock side. And uh, I wasn't feeling real good those days. And, and, uh, we had a doctor on board the ship, and, and he couldn't find anything that would cure me. So, but we finally got orders to uh, the ship was being sent to Italy to uh, participate in shore bombardment. They they had invaded Italy. And the troops were moving northward, and they, uh, the ship was ordered to go. Do some shore bombardment uh, to help me help mm -hmm. this movement. And, and the uh, captain asked the doctor if I was fit for for uh, battle duty, and the doctor said no. So they kicked me off the ship. And they, uh, I just went off the ship and piled my gear on the dock. And I was left there all alone, and, and the ship went off. And uh, uh, 
I heard later that it went up there and did very well in the Sherbaugh Award, but, but it also, you know, I was hit by uh, a, a shell from the shore. They said that was the only ship. I I think at that time they said it was the only ship ever hit by a shore hmm. fire, and I asked where it was hit, and they said. They said it was in my battle station. I Is that right? I don't know whether they were pulling my leg or not. I, I've never been able to find a record on this or anything about it. But anyway, I I got all this from a, uh, a chief engineering officer that uh, that uh, I ran into later, and he, he was telling me all about this. And I don't know if he's pulling my leg or not. But anyway, I was left ashore on, and uh, here's El Kabir, and somewhere or other I borrowed a jeep. And I, they said there's a clinic over yonder, 15 miles away, and, and I could go there and, and they'd take care of me. So I went over. I drove over and found this clinic and went in and said, oh, they said, sure, you can, uh, we can take care of you here. And I said, well, my stuff's over. But, oh, well, I, I had to go back and get that. I went back and got that. I don't know how I disposed of the Jeep. I can't remember the details of all this. I, all I remember is I went into the uh, uh, clinic and they, put me in a bed and I went to sleep and when I woke up I looked around and the the other patients in the ward said, Boy, we're glad to see you move. I said, You hadn't moved for twenty four hours. Wow. Huh. And, uh, uh, they kept me there just a short while and then they moved me to a field hospital outside of town. And uh, I spent a month there, and they worked on me trying to find out what I had. And uh, there was one old doctor there; I remember him very well. He he was very interested in my case, and, and uh, it was really a sore throat, and it was there's a sort of a fungal type growth around it, which mystified him anyway. He, he came to me one day and he said, I think I found it. He showed me a uh, thing in the in one of the naval journals, medical journals. And he said, this, this is a disease that is found only on, in people on submarines and uh, destroyers. In other words, people in close contact. And it turned out to be mononucleosis, which of course is uh, sort of a common disease nowadays. Mm -hmm. In those days they didn't know anything about. Hmm. Anyway, I got feeling pretty well after the, after that. I was ready to, to leave, but the doctor said, no, I want to run a test on you. He said, I need sheep cells for this, and I don't have any. And I said, I see sheep across this fence. I can go get you one. And he said, no. Uh, so I stayed there. In the meantime, I got a uh, a cold sore that involved my entire nose and lips, well, both lips, and then it came up in the corner of my eye here, left eye, and um, uh, the uh, it finally went away, but uh, it proved. To be more damaging, I'll, I'll get into this later. It's, uh, it's influenced my life a lot. Anyway, they, they finally let me go from the uh, uh, hospital, and I hitched a ride back to the States on a, uh, a Coast Guard ship, a uh, destroyer escort that was convoying a group back, and it was a very slow convoy. It took us a full month oh, to get across the Atlantic. 
on this uh, destroyer escort. And it was not like my destroyer. Our, our destroyer, would, when it rolled, it was a sort of a slow roll. This destroyer escort had a snap roll. It would go this way. You'd walk down the, the passageway on that, and you'd bump into this door. And just, you'd have bruised shoulders by the time you got the length of the ship. <laughs> it was pretty rough, and I, uh, I volunteered to do anything I could on the ship. Of course, not being a member of the crew, the captain said, oh no, I, I couldn't do that. Besides, he was Coast Guard and I was Navy. And so I just read and did other, did other things. It, was, it would have been a nice vacation if it weren't so boring. But uh, I eventually got back and went back to uh, uh, Norfolk, awaiting assignment, and uh, I think it was there while I was there that uh, the European War ended, and uh, but they sent me to uh, San Francisco to join the USS Buck, which is under construction in San Francisco. Now, in that transfer, did that give you a chance to get home to Douglas and see I got them? to Douglas. I, I went to Douglas and we, I had a nice visit at home. And I think it was during hunting season and we, uh, uh, while I was there, I remember we went out and had love hunting and, and uh, I acted as a guide for, we, we had a friend, he's a, a, a millionaire from Denver. Who, did a lot of oil drilling in Wyoming, and my dad did his Leo work. And he brought, uh, usually he'd bring a plane load of people in to uh, Douglas and, uh, uh, for hunting trips. And anyway, I acted for as a guide for him one time while I was home. And, and when I went back, uh, as uh, going back to San Francisco, I happened to go back at the same time uh, his daughter was leaving. She was going back to school on the West Coast and with some other girls from of her age. And, and I remember we were playing poker one time. The train was to go up from Denver to, Sh to Cheyenne and across Wyoming and the southern border. We got up to Cheyenne, the train was set back to Denver, and we had to go back through Norrell Gorge to, <laughs> because the bridge had burned down on the track. So we were sent on this, uh, through this other track, and we got through the gorge all right, but uh, I remember we got up in the morning, and this gal and I were playing penny ante poker, and her, she, she had a uh, one of these little stateroom type things that you had in the, uh, on the, uh, well, what did they call those cars in, on the trains in those days? On a Pullman? On a Pullman car. Anyway, we we had the door open and, and we had a little table between us. And there were pennies on the, on the table. And, and, uh, uh, all of a sudden, there was a. Well, the, the, the train was actually stopped. We were waiting for other trains to go by, and there was a sudden jerk, and the table collapsed, and our pennies went scattering all over the, the passageway. And uh, this girl, whose father was worth millions, was down on her hands and knees, picking up these pennies and, and grabbing them so no one else could get them. I was very amused at that, and, but uh, uh, we were stuck there for about a day because uh, some other train had been put onto the same siding we were and it didn't stop quickly enough until it hit us from behind. And uh, so we had to, to wait a while. And all of the time this gal was saying, well, I can call my daddy and he can send an airplane for us. But uh, 
I don't know whether that could have been done during wartime. Gasoline was hard to come by. But anyway, I met at San Francisco. I was stationed on Treasure Island. And we, uh, I, about all I did there was to attend different kinds of schools. And uh, we were supposed to be training crews to uh, uh, take over the buck when, when it was ready for commission. Uh, I don't remember doing much training myself. I just remember going from one school to the other. I, I think I went to two firefighting schools. I went to damage control schools, uh, all sorts of schools dealing with how to run ships. That's one thing I've got to say about the Navy is they do train you. And it's a good thing because uh, you get into trouble out at sea, you're, you're in real trouble. And you've got to do it and take care of things by yourself. So, so uh, uh, I spent, I think, eight or nine months in San Francisco. And while I was there, the, uh, the war ended. And I remember VJ Day going, uh, I was on the island, and I could hear. It was, the island was a mile out from, from uh, the city. And I could hear what was going on from the, at that distance. And, and I just couldn't bear it. So I, I caught a ferry and went over there to the city. And as I was walking up the street, I ran into a, a couple of girls that I knew. Is that right? And uh, uh, they rushed over and grabbed me and said, get us out of here. They said, we're, we're afraid. And uh, uh, I was trying to escort them out. And as I did, some sailor came rushing down from in front of me and he grabbed my hat and ran off down the, the street with it. I took out after him and, and uh, I sort of lost him in the car. But then I saw a tall sailor and with an officer's hat on and I climbed up his back and grabbed the hat. <laughs> and this guy turned around and said, what are you doing? I said, I'm getting my hat back. He says, that's not your hat. I looked at it and it had two, two rows of scrambled eggs. In other words, he, he grabbed some admiral's hat. I, I gave it back to him and I went back and, and got the girls out of, out of town where they felt safe. But it was a real riot there. People weren't mad or anything, but crazy. Ooh, I, I saw guys climbing the, the fronts of buildings and, and uh, uh, just going mad. All the liquor stores were broken into and everyone was drunk. And, and it was really not a good place for a single girl to be, I'll tell you. So, uh, anyway, I spent some time on Treasure Island and, and uh, eventually I was shipped to Japan. I went to Japan on a uh, an army es uh, on an army transport. And I was put in charge of a group of soldiers. And I didn't know what the hell to do with soldiers on on a ship. What can you do? There's the only thing you, you do. You were sailing along. They all you're looking for is a place to rest or to to be comfortable and, and uh, it was, I forget, I think about a 10 day trip. But it was a, we finally got to Japan and I uh, was, I disembarked at, uh, in Tokyo Bay at, um, oh, I forget the name of the, the town. But, uh, Yokohama? Yokohama. Not Yokohama, uh, Yokosuka. Uh, and I got a room in a, in a barracks there. Next door to me were two, two other naval officers. And uh, 
I recognized them because I'd seen them in National Geographic. They, huh. they were the Craighead twins who were famous for, uh, as young boys, they became falconers and they had been invited to India to work with a Maharaja who was uh, uh, also a falconer and they made a movie about it. Anyway, I, I got acquainted with them. There, they had just come down from Mount Kiliman, uh, Mount uh, Fujiyama, where they had been testing uh, winter gear. They were writing a book on survival for the Navy. And uh, they were just packing up, getting ready to come home, and they were uh, getting all sorts of bonsai trees and things like that they were bringing back. But, uh, uh, I spent, oh, I don't know, a week or two in, in uh, Yokosuka, got into Tokyo a few times, uh, but eventually I was shipped out as the southern part of uh, the island. Uh, and I forget which town I was to go to, it was either Yokoyama or Wakayama one or the other, whichever one it was, I went to the wrong one. My ship wasn't there, so they put me back on on the train. And this was, it was an ordeal because uh, uh, I was trying to smuggle in a bunch of whiskey. <laughs> uh, one of the fellas that I'd gone through school with was on army transports and he, he said the best thing you can do is to go in an office club, buy several bottles of whiskey and take it along with you and they, they uh, this and cigarettes were good trade items overseas. Well, when I got there, they were just changing the currency in, in Japan, so it wasn't a good time to try to sell this stuff. And I still had my whiskey and my I, I had a big, big box of, of clothing and stuff, and it weighed probably uh, uh, oh, 80 pounds, maybe, so it was very heavy. And uh, uh, I was in this railroad station, I said, well, I, I have got to catch this train and that's on the tracks way over yonder, and there was a a uh, set of stairs, probably 50 steps, in big long flight of stairs. And I said, "How do I get this thing over there?" And, and they said, "Oh, well, we'll get you porters." So they gave me two two little bandy-legged Japanese guys as porters, and, and uh, I thought, "Well, this is good. They can carry two men can carry this box fine." But, the way they did it is one guy lifted it up onto the back of the other guy and the one man carried it and he started staggering up these steps and I could just visualize this guy falling backwards and all my whiskey <laughs> being lost. So. so I was right behind him ready to catch that, that thing but we finally made it across to the other railroad station and I finally got uh, uh, across the tracks and we, we went to the other city. And I did find my ship there, which was the uh, uh, M.K. Perry. And uh, I joined that ship. And I don't think we did much practice firing or anything there. I, I don't remember much about being on that ship except the trip back to uh, uh, Hawaii. We escorted the, the battleship that had, uh, they had signed the peace treaty on. In Missouri? In the Missouri. We escorted that back to, mm -hmm. to Pearl Harbor. And then our ship pulled into Pearl Harbor and, and we docked there. With, uh, we were going in and out of Pearl Harbor, and we do a lot of practice. 
while in, while in uh, Pearl Harbor, our uh, wardroom chef had usually just been been an ordinary cook. But when we were there, we got a chef who was had been a chef in one of the big New York hotels. And boy, the meals we got after that were were outstanding. They they were great. And I, the thing is, the ship was being prepared to go to the uh, atom bomb test in, in we talk oh. where, where it was. And uh, uh, but at this time they were releasing people and. And uh, uh, anyway, the the fellow who had been the engi engineering officer was released, and I was made engineering officer of the ship. Uh, the captain, who happened to be from Wyoming, he was from Riverston, Wyoming. I remember his name was Smith, and uh, uh, he was a Wyoming boy too. So he tried to persuade me to. Uh, stay in the real list. He told me about all the great trips we'd make to places like Hong Kong and things like this. Well, somewhere out of there, I was ready to go home. And uh, I did stay stay longer until they could get a, a replacement for me. But finally, I was flown back to San Francisco, and then I was. Shipped up to Seattle to get to be uh, uh, released from the Navy. And, 